Hello, folks. Um, welcome again to English 102. Uh, as you can see, this video lecture will be for um, English 102 CRN 21940, 21971, and 21972. Um, so this is going to be a video lecture for module three in which you have your essay one due, which is due February 21st. Um, but today's uh, February 3rd, and I wanna give you plenty of time to start thinking about it and choosing a topic and so on. Um, pretty much all of the files that I'm gonna show you today and information is Inside of our <clears throat> Google Drive, remember you can access this if you're in Canvas on the home page here. And as a reminder, do not, do not, do not access Canvas or try to do Canvas online coursework using a phone or a tablet. Please use a laptop or a desktop computer, which it was designed for. But uh, here's our uh, Google Drive link at the top. If you just click that link, um, you don't have to be logged into uh, Google to access it, but these are all of the course documents as well as uh, every uh, essay uh, with resources. So if you just click on, for example, essay one, the topic or very broad topic of erasing racial injustice, you'll see here that there are a bunch of files it includes images, uh, MP3 files. If you go over here and toggle the switch here from the list view to the grid view, you'll see that it also contains readings, PDF files. Um, and this is because uh, there are many different possible topics for you to choose, but I've already kind of gathered or called some sources for you. Uh, that you can, you know, use, cite, incorporate into your essay one. Okay, um, so uh, and, uh, right now we're going to be uh, focusing again on module three here, <clears throat> and um, I'm going to kind of work through these links uh, right now. Of course, I'm creating this video lecture. Um, and <clears throat> there is already actually another link in the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Canvas module three to uh, a video lecture on uh, how to avoid plagiarism. And I will, uh, go over that and remind you of that issue in detail. Um, so two separate video lectures for this uh, essay, uh, as will be the case for all. So if you were to click on this, right, this essay one guide inside of uh, our Google Drive or inside of uh, um, Canvas, uh, or I logged out. Uh, it will take you to the, what I call essay guide, right? So uh, you can just do it here inside the homepage. This is module three and it says essay one guide. If you just click this link, it'll take you to a PDF file inside of our Google Drive. Uh, and so this is what you will be initially working from and with. Um, Notice how uh, it says, let me go to the version on my desktop. Um, there's the due date, February 21st. Notice how it says, follow this outline. Um, this uh, set of essays, essays one, two, three, and four, all follow this exact uh, persuasive or argumentative outline. And uh, it's very prescriptive in that sense. In other words, do not deviate from it, do not change it up. So everyone should be turning in, uh, you know, a minimum of six paragraphs here because each one of these Roman numerals is a paragraph. 
um, so this is structured like your basic, what we call a five paragraph essay that you hopefully would have seen in college and perhaps English 101. <clears throat> the difference, however, is paragraph two in which uh, you don't typically have that in a five paragraph essay. So that's why this is ending up with, as you can see, six paragraphs. Um, but paragraph two, as you can see, is what's called the refutation of the opposition. And this is a fancy phrase or rhetorical phrase to mean rejecting or disagreeing with your opponents. Okay, as you can see here, you need a couple of reasons of what your opponents think about the issue uh, so that you can then spend the rest of the essay in paragraphs three, four, and five here, color-coded, uh, explaining the three reasons why you think um, your opponents here in paragraph two are wrong. So uh, as you can see, it's a color-coded uh, outline. I have an image just to kind of uh, show you what I mean by that. Uh, Thought I did. Oh, it's in, uh, sorry, it's in course documents, I believe. Hmm. Well, um, not to worry, it's, uh, it might actually be here in our drive. I guess it's not. The, what I was trying to point out with this image that I can't find at the moment is that you can see that the green, yellow, and blue here are color-coded to paragraphs three, four, and five, respectively. And the reason I've done that, again, very prescriptive, is that um, in case you have forgotten or you need to review a thesis, very simply put, is your topic. So let's say you're gonna be talking about defunding the police, and your point of view is that we should or we should not. You could argue either one, um, but you need to come up with three reasons why we should or should not defund the police or why we should or should not uh, fine NFL team owners for requiring people to stand during the national anthem, right? But those, whatever topic you choose, uh, from here on the, the second page of the guide, uh, those three reasons, right, will be explained in detail in the same order that you present them, one, two, and three here in the outline, right? So when you say, you know, we should, uh, you know, the topic is to say, finding uh, right here, where is it? Uh, right here, number five, four. Uh, should NFL teams be fined or penalized for violating First Amendment rights if they require players to stand for a national anthem? And you could say, okay, so that's the topic, you know, penalizing NFL uh, team owners, uh, and they should be penalized somehow. And the reasons are one, two, and three. They're violating players' First Amendment rights to express their point of view. Um, the, there is no official law that says, you know, around the nation that you're required to stand unless the only exception is, is in the United States military. If you're in the military, you're required by law uh, to stand in 
uh, salute if you're in uniform or put your hand over your heart. Uh, but if you're a regular civilian, there isn't a law for that. Uh, there is a kind of code of conduct that people sort of expect you to follow, but it's not codified. And then the third reason could be uh, that, um, you know, the team owners are ever, you know, requiring this standing, uh, that they're overlooking the real fundamental issue of racial injustice, right? I mean, that's why people are kneeling or sitting in the first place during the anthem. So if you were to choose those three reasons, then they would appear uh, described in detail in the body of your essay and supported, as you can see here, with uh, specific facts or quotations or sources about why your opponent is wrong. Notice this is not one, but it's two at the bare minimum, three is ideal. Uh, but this is why, you know, fact or quotation, this is why you have this Google Drive um, with, uh, with all of these, uh, go back here to SA1, with all these sources in here, um, whether it's images or interviews or uh, PDF files, readings, right? You can use any of these uh, for your sources to back up your, your reasons in the, uh, here in the, the body of your essay for why you think something should or should not be. And then of course, there's a conclusion. Um, please do not, please read the outline carefully. Please do not simply just restate your thesis, but say it in a different way. <clears throat> and um, before you submit, notice here in bold red text, before you submit, you need to follow this English essay final draft checklist. That's actually part of the module here you see, right? Uh, apply this English final draft uh, checklist. Because if you do, as I'll show you here, um, here's the checklist. So again, if you were to click on this, this link here, right? As I will do, it'll open up a PDF file in our Google Drive, and, and this is it. And there are 35 questions to uh, answer before you actually submit. And if you do all of these, as the instructions say, apply the checklist thoroughly and accurately before submitting any written assignment in this course, check each box only after completing each item. So don't just simply look and go, oh yeah, my paragraphs in logical order, number two, right? Actually look at your essay. So I'd recommend printing out this document or at least having it open the entire time you're uh, you know, looking at the final draft of your essay. And um, you know, before you check it off or move to the number three, make sure your paragraphs in logical order. And they should be if you're again following this outline, right? So you have, you know, reasons one, two, and three, and here they are color coded again, one, two, and three in the body of your essay. Um, because as you see, like, you know, number three asks, have I closely and thoroughly followed the outline? So if you haven't, then you can't check off number three, right? Um, I ask you, have I, you, have I used the sample MLA paper as a model for how to format my essay and work cited? So in the, excuse me, the module itself, there is this direction that says, follow this MLA style sample paper. And again, if you click that link, it'll open a PDF file, uh, which I recommend you downloading because this is the format you'll be following throughout the entire semester um, that shows you with instructions on the side and margin uh, what your paper is supposed to visually look like. Uh, the, this border here right on the edges uh, is supposed to represent the edges of a sheet of paper, you know, printed page. Um, and you know, it shows you in detail of how to cite, how to 
use uh, transitions, and then of course at the end of how to document your sources. Uh, these sources here listed on what's called the Works Cited page is a list of sources in alphabetical order. This is the version on my uh, computer drive. Is a list of sources in alphabetical order that uh, you have actually cited in your essay at least once. And again, there's going to be a separate video lecture. Or really, there's already one from last semester, but it's the same information of how to cite and document. So uh, just there's a reminder in case you don't remember. Uh, this alphabetical list of sources here, not simply a URL. If you throw in just a, you know, a web address, uh, that will be counted wrong. Uh, it needs to be fully documented like this. Um, so this alphabetical list is called the works cited, but it's a list in alphabetical order documenting your sources, which means that each one of these listed here in hanging indent formation, meaning that the first line here is left hanging by itself so our eyes can scan down the list very quickly. So like this one, it says Fraunheim here, right? This means that this source has been cited that is mentioned specifically at least once, maybe more, at least once in the essay above. And if you go up here, uh, there's, there's an example right there, quoted in Fraunheim, okay? Uh, meaning that Fraunheim is the source, but the person who is saying or speaking this quotation in that article, you can see this is a quotation, uh, is not Fraunheim himself, but it's a guy named Bill Coleman. And this is what is described over here as the student writer, Anna Orloff, um, who has an indirect source, uh, and that's signaled by QTD and quoted in. QTD stands for quoted, quoted in this source. So again, uh, here's a quotation, starts here. It ends right there at the end of efficiencies. And it, it is not Bill Coleman, who is the author of the article. He happens to be, as you can see, a salary at, actually he's been an executive at salary.com but he's the one saying it in Fraunheim, Ed Fraunheim is the one who has written the article. If we go down again and look at it alphabetically on the works cited, Ed Fraunheim is the author. He wrote an article called Stop Reading This Headline and Get Back to Work. We know it's an article because you can see it's in quotation marks. Um, the sponsor of the, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the website itself is, uh, cnetnews.com. So a shortened version of the website is all you need. You do not need an entire uh, web address or URL. In fact, I uh, recommend you do not use an entire URL to throw into your works cited entries. This next portion is the sponsor of the website. Uh, notice that cnetnews.com and cnet networks are not the same. That's why you often need the sponsor because it's often different. Then the publication date, uh, MLA style has a reverse order. So instead of July 11th, it's 11 July 2005. It is a web source as opposed to a print source. And then your access, or in this case, the student Anna Orloff, she accessed it seven, 17th of February, 2006. Uh, so all of that information needs to be there regardless of whether you are using sources in, you know, here inside of our Google Drive for SA1, or you find other sources elsewhere online. All right, um, so that's the, uh, the MLA formatting you're supposed to follow. Uh, you know, the heading, you have a title. Uh, speaking of a title, everyone needs a title. Every essay 
by definition needs a title. Um, your title, let's you know, say you were going to, for example, write on that topic of uh, number number four here about NFL teams being penalized. Um, so your title would not be, uh, sorry, your title would not be NFL fines or finding the NFL. Um, that's the topic, right? It's too broad. So um, a title, and I mentioned this uh, a couple of times uh, early on when we met in January, a title is two things required. One, uh, it is the topic, of course, you need to tell your reader what you're writing about. And then notice there's a colon right here. You can have a colon or not have a colon. It depends on how you format your title. Um, and then the second ingredient in a good title is that it's interesting or it should generate some kind of interest in your reader audience. In this case, it's generating interest in here, what we call the subtitle. So everything that follows the colon here is called a subtitle, titled and subtitle. And the reason it generates some interest is that uh, if you just wrote online monitoring, say like that's my title or NFL finding or finding the NFL, like your reader doesn't know what your point of view is. So your point of view needs to generate some interest in what you think about the topic. In this case, you can see in the student uh, subtitle, a threat to employee privacy in the wired workplace. We now know uh, Anna Orloff, the student writer, this was an actual real paper. Um, you can see that the word threat indicates what she thinks about online monitoring, that it's not a good thing. She's going to argue against it. So, uh, you know, you need to have a title. And in fact, uh, the essay, uh, what do you call it? Uh, checklist says right here, number 11, have I chosen an informative and interesting title? Notice it says not or, that you need to have both ingredients, right? So if you submit, a paper with what I would call the topic, or worse yet, if you actually just use copy and paste the entire, you know, uh, what we call prompt and put it in as your title, uh, you will also lose points, All right? Um, do not copy and paste the prompt. These are all possible topics or prompts to write on. So come up with your own interesting, innovative title. Um, okay, so that's, you know, in essence, uh, if you're looking at the, the module, uh, you know, there's the essay guide that I just discussed right now, I'm creating this video lecture um, and the files I pointed to you in the Google Drive uh, that's the MLA sample paper I was showing you, and as well, the English essay final draft checklist. Your essay is due, in this case, Monday, February 21st at midnight, and it needs to be uploaded in module three. So do not, you know, make sure you're paying attention. Do not upload it in module four, five, or six, right? Because uh, if you do, right, I say here, be sure to submit your essay with the module three. Otherwise, the Canvas grade book will not be able to calculate, calculate your grade. In other words, um, there will be no document, no assignment inside of module three if you do not put it in module three. And therefore, I can't grade it. I can't assign a grade. Um, so make sure you're following directions. And it says it again at the top of uh, the essay guide here, right? So submit as a Word document. Speaking of Word document, uh, all of you folks have access to uh, Microsoft Word inside of your, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 
your Gmail, basically, your Grambling student email. Um, <clears throat> so you should have already, you know, been logging into checking your Grambling email or having your Grambling email forwarded to your personal email. But up here you see this Office 365 link, right? And so notice, um, I'll just do it for you here. It takes a moment for me because I have a two-factor authentication. Um, so your username will be different, obviously, but also it's uh, a different domain name. It, yours as a student will be gsumail.gram.edu because all faculty simply have this gram.edu domain name. Um, oh wait, no, it's not gonna let me do this in Firefox. Yeah, uh, for some reason, um, cause I'm, I'm trying to show you how to access a word in case you do not, in other words, you don't need to fret about running out to buy Word if you don't have it or have it on your computer. You can, you know, uh, access it. And I'm showing you Word because um, I do not want you to uh, toss in, you know, a link in a Canvas inbox message or a regular email to your Google Docs folder. Uh, in fact, I don't want you to use Google Docs at all. Uh, why? Because it's uh, not very user friendly and it doesn't format things very well. <laughs> Remember Google and Microsoft, uh, they're rivals. So uh, their programs, Google Docs versus Microsoft Word, um, they don't play well together, so to speak, in terms of formatting. So if you want to have correct formatting, like the MLA style paper that I've shown you, then please format your paper in uh, Microsoft Word. So once this occurs and I have to uh, open my two-factor authentication and approve the request, just a safety measure there. Um, and then notice this is your, you know, kind of interface for Microsoft, uh, what do you call it? Microsoft Office. And, you know, here are all these closures because, you know, the university is closing tomorrow or later this afternoon, today, because of the winter, anyway. But over here uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you see these dots, right? Uh, if you just click this, it will show you that you have access to all of the Microsoft products uh, in what's called the Microsoft Office Suite. So you have Outlook, which is the you know, email program you're, you're looking at right here. Um, Drive, which is where you can, uh, cloud where you can save your documents and people can share with you. Uh, you have Word, right? Uh, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, all of these, uh, you know, uh, things. If you click on Word here, uh, it will open Microsoft Word for you. And then you can start creating your document in Microsoft Word. Um, so this is what I recommend you do. You know, you start with a new blank document. And uh, there you go. Uh, pretty simple. Um, so I'm going to reluctantly show you, because I know some of you will insist on using uh, Google Docs, because either that's what you've done or uh, you are unfamiliar with Microsoft Word, which uh, folks, if you have not used Microsoft Word, you're unfamiliar with it, you're doing yourself no favors. Uh, Microsoft Word remains the industry standard. And what I mean by that is um, across the globe uh, in pretty much all professions, Microsoft Word in the professional realm is still used. There are people more and more using Google Docs, but uh, they require people to uh, 
what do you call it, to start, you know, converting. So notice that, uh, you know, I have uh, some documents here, right? Uh, and you can in, uh, in Google Docs, uh, probably just go there. Uh, you can convert uh, to what do you call it? Uh, Microsoft Word. In fact, you you need to. You uh, you're going to be required to. Um, so let's see here. I have a annotated bibliography that I you know share with my students uh, when I'm teaching methods of research. And as you can see, this is you know in Google Docs, but uh, up here in the uh, upper left hand corner under file. Okay. Right. File. And there brings a pull down menu. Then go to download. And notice the very first option is download as a Microsoft Word DLCX file. And I'm telling you folks this because you will not be allowed to upload any other kind of document into essay, I mean, uh, into module three, or for that matter, four, five, and six. So all three of our, excuse me, all four of our uh, uh, modules here, right? Module three, module four, they all say, you know, submit it as a Word doc, submit it as a Word doc dot docx, right? So if you, like I said, insist on using uh, Google Docs, which I do not recommend you do because you already have access to Microsoft Word and um, you know Office 365 with your Grambling email uh, access. But if you do, once you finish your paper, then before you upload it to Module 3, go to File, Download as a Microsoft Word doc here, right? When you click that, it'll ask you, of course, where do you want to download it? Like what, you know, folder, if you will. Um, and let's say I just want to put it on my desktop. Um, and I always prefer to include the file extension just to be on the safe side, so to speak. So, you know, give it whatever title. Let's say, theoretically, you're going to say, you know, uh, Jones SA1, and then the file extension .docx, OK? Um, that file extension .docx will, of course, force uh, it to save as a document file. And then there, I did that. I, Save it as a document, a Word document file to my desktop. And uh, let's see, it's not showing up, but it's there. So there it is. Okay. Um, and then this is the document. Once you've saved it to, and you should, you should save it to your hard drive, or at the very least, you know send yourself a email copy. You always want to, especially for 100% fully online courses, you always want to keep an electronic record of your documents and you know, ideally a cloud or email or both. Uh, but this is the document that you would then upload into module three. Um, so in module three, uh, you know, if we actually go to the modules and it says here, module three, right? Um, this is, you know, what it will look like. And of course, uh, I'm in the faculty view right now, but if I click on student view, this is what yours will look like, right? So start assignment and, 
the starting of assignment simply means you upload your document. And notice here, what do you have to do? You have to submit a file, you have to upload a file. And what kind of file? A DOCX file. That is the only file format that these modules three, four, five, and six will take. And the reason I do that is because once I can, uh, or once it's in, uh, in this case, module three, uh, then I can grade it with marking uh, highlighted comments and remarks for you uh, so that you had feedback on your writing. Uh, you cannot really do that so easily with other document formats. So anyhow, um, so that's enough about uh, how to upload the document. Uh, make sure, you know, if you have any problems with this, you know, certainly message me in Canvas and let me know, but uh, hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna look at a couple of topics <clears throat> to show you like, you know, okay, how could I, you know, take this outline and, you know, start putting together my essay? Um, well, let's take uh, this one right here, just, you know, because you could take any, any one of these. Uh, remember, only, only choose one. Um, Theoretically, let's say you're interested in number three. It says <clears throat> should, and notice by the way that virtually all of these begin with the word should, which of course automatically causes you, the arguer, the writer, uh, to take a side, to take a position. Uh, you must be arguing something in order to try to convince your audience. So this says three, should states the decline Medicaid funding be fined by the federal government so that the fine money can be used to help low income people? And well, what do I mean by that? Well, inside of your uh, Google Drive, there is this following uh, document, which is a PDF file by the Human Rights Watch, as you can see. And it is, uh, submission to the committee for the elimination of racial discrimination, right? So this is, this is what we're talking about with this, this essay topic about erasing racism. Well, how can we do that, right? This is one possible way. Uh, this is a few years ago in uh, 2014, but it's still relevant. And so in the table of contents, you'll see here that one of the, aside from, you know, racial discrimination in the criminal justice system, which there certainly is, and you know, profiling of American Muslims, which there certainly is, and other kinds of discrimination against other people of color and so on. Um, but one of the issues, of course, is that topic number three that we're looking at here of uh, you know, Medicaid funding uh, for low-income people. And this discusses that, right? So uh, this is a document you can use as a source to help you flesh out your facts, if you will, because remember, uh, go back to the essay outline here, right? Because in your body paragraphs here, you need specific facts or quotations or you know maybe a chart or a table, whatever, of, of how it is you agree that okay, yes, we should find uh, these individual states. Uh, and this uh, section here of this document talks about it. So uh, I'm not sure if you all are aware, but uh, now keep in mind, uh, just to put in perspective, Obama was elected in 2008 and took uh, office in 2009 and left office in, uh, in the very beginning of 2017, right? So the dates here will help contextualize this. <clears throat> the committee that is the committee that's writing this uh, document noted in 2008, it's concerned that racial minorities lack adequate access to healthcare in the United States. And you see there a, a 53 superscript, right? And 
they're following a different documentation style. Um, but nonetheless, what this shows you is just like I expect you to cite and document your sources, in our case, according to MLA style, um, they are doing the same thing. So down here at the bottom of the page, you see here that source is the UN Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, right? And you can go find that if you wanted to, instead of using this uh, Human Rights Watch 2014 uh, PDF file as your source, but you could totally do it if you wanted. But if you wanted to go to the original source for where they're getting their information, you could go to paragraph 16 of this 2008 document and find out where it is. They talk about this concern for uh, adequate access to healthcare. I remember one of the chief concerns of the Obama administration was getting through what is called the uh, ACA, also called the Affordable Care Act, uh, derisively or pejoratively called Obamacare for people who don't like it uh, or by people who don't like it. So um, continuing in 2010, Congress passed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act which gave, gives US states the opportunity to reduce the number of people with no health insurance by among other measures, expanding eligibility for Medicaid in the public health insurance program for low income persons. <clears throat> so that kind of long winded sentence is saying that in 2010, that is you know, a year or so into Obama's uh, presidency, Congress passed this law that said, hey, you know, we are going to give states the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to have more um, low income people have access to uh, Medicaid and thereby, you know, have uh, some kind of health insurance, right? Which I think is pretty important. Uh, not I think, it, of course we know, right? Like <clears throat> if you don't have your health, the, don't have much. And so um, 2010, it was, you know, put in place. However, 2012, right, when the, um, what do you call it, uh, the Congress shifted in terms of going from mostly Democratic to uh, Republican, because there are a lot of angry people that a Black person was in office in the White House, um, then that Congress in 2012 uh, said the U.S. Supreme Court gave states the option uh, to decline Medicaid expansion. So you can find that, from, you know, number 54 here uh, in this court case. And this court case is simply reflecting um, the, at the time, the will of in some ways, both the Congress and the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the Supreme Court itself. And therefore, what this allows the states to do is say, well, you know what, we don't have to, as our individual state, whether it's Texas, Louisiana, Florida, whatever, we don't have to take the money from the federal government and then use it for Medicaid for low-income people. So uh, that's an option, right? But of course, in doing so, you leave a whole bunch of low-income people, regardless of their color, uh, out of you know uh, Medicaid access. Remember, Medicaid is uh, healthcare for low-income people. Don't confuse that with what's called Medicare, which is for the elderly. And then, as of June 2014, so two years later, 21 states have determined not to expand. Medicaid for its uninsured population, right? That's almost half of the nation, 21 states out of 50, right? Despite the fact that the majority of costs for the expansion will be paid by the federal government. Eight of these states are in the Southern US where most African-Americans in the US reside. So um, why do states like, you know, Texas and, Mississippi and other states in the South predominantly, why do they not want to take this money 
which as you can see here, it's paid for by the federal government because those conservative state legislatures um, feel as though giving money to, uh, what do you call it, uh, low-income people is like, you know, a handout. Uh, I want to point out here, this is a map you have in your, uh, or set of maps you have in your Google folder, that a lot of problematic issues arise in Southern states. And I should maybe just uh, remind you, give you a kind of brief history lesson as we're we'll talking about in a minute, that here's a, a map of, you know, the Southern holding states, as you can see here, right? Free and slave holding states. Um, so here in the South and sort of the pink and red areas were, you know, those, you know, of the Confederacy basically. Uh, whereas in the dark green, you know, that would be the Union and the free holding states here uh, in the Midwest and to the West. So if you think of that historical context and then look at this, collection of maps here. Well, where do you have most Protestants, mostly Baptist in the South? Where in the United States is a higher income level? Well, in the Northeast and in the North and Midwest, not in the South. Uh, where do you have great, greater rates of poverty throughout the South? Um, where do you have, you know, child abuse issues? you know, largely speaking in the South, uh, higher rates of diabetes in the South, um, teen pregnancy throughout the South and Southwest, uh, right? So there's a real kind of correlation between um, the kind of endemic or deeply embedded uh, problems that were brought on by slavery that still remain right, what we might call structural racism or institutionalized racism. So um, this document here is pointing out how a number of these states, right, right most in the Southern United States, uh, or many of the 21, uh, declined to provide people of, uh, you know, low-income Medicaid healthcare. And so that's the kind of, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, you could you could paraphrase or quote any of that information and put it inside of you know uh, your essay as a fact or an example of what you mean by yes, people uh, should have access to uh, healthcare if they're low income and therefore the states who decline Medicaid funding from the federal government, sort of like free money. Um, not not really free because it's coming from taxpayer money, but um, that you know that helps you bolster your argument against your opposition here. That is what people would argue in uh, paragraph two. Speaking of which, so you have to think in paragraph two like your opponents, or you know, well, what you know, if I'm arguing in this particular issue. Uh, number three, if I'm arguing that yes, states should be fined by the federal government, um, what are my opponents arguing against or arguing against me for, right? And you have to think like your opponents in order to make paragraph two work. In this case, uh, for this topic, you have to think like uh, one of these, you know, 21 states, uh, that like Texas, for example, uh, who have declined Medicaid uh, funding. And the reason why they have declined Medicaid funding is on the one hand, um, they believe that that kind of federal funding to low-income people is like a handout and they don't want, in their view, these conservative legislatures they don't want, um, you know, people being coming dependent, so to speak, on uh, what we might broadly call welfare or government handouts in, in their view. But they also would argue 
uh, this very kind of fundamental issue called uh, states' rights. And it comes from this, uh, hopefully you may have encountered this in high school, if not your college classes, it comes from this notion of what's called federalism, right? Um, and so in the United States, uh, you know, we have 50 states and each one of these states gets to make its own laws, right? Um, and so it's not until two thirds of the states get to vote the same way that, you know, we have a constitutional amendment or we have uh, a rule that applies, you know, across all 50 states. So, so for example, um, in all 50 states in the United States, it is illegal, as you probably know, uh, to drive behind the wheel, regardless of what vehicle, without wearing a seatbelt. That used to not be the case when I was growing up, certainly. Um, but now you can be fined, uh, pull over and stopped, you know, for not wearing a seatbelt. Well, that is a federal national law. But before that, individual states uh, could make up their own law. Here's another example. Uh, right now, uh, we don't have a federal law for what we call capital punishment. Um, capital punishment is also known as a death penalty. And you can see here that we as a nation of 50 states vary widely on this issue. Um, so this color-coded area is showing you that these states that are in uh, red, that within the last 10 years, uh, these mostly in the South states have in fact committed executions of prisoners, uh, whereas those in green and blue, um, they typically either don't have capital punishment, they don't have it at all, or they haven't uh, actually carried one out. Uh, as you can see here with the blue, like California, Oregon, capital punishment uh, has been suspended, so to speak, the this, this statute, the law. <clears throat> so um, this is an example, uh, like say marijuana laws as well. We'll get to that in uh, SA3, but uh, where all of the 50 states don't agree, you know, uh, but that's one of the arguments, again, that in paragraph two, your, your opposition, those who would oppose, you know, uh, the states, if you will, or people, legislatures that would oppose taking the Medicaid funding from the federal government, uh, that would be an example of why. It's one, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, you know, they don't want people to be dependent on, you know, what they call government handouts and, uh, you know, uh, welfare state, so to speak. And two, uh, they view their right as a state to determine their own state laws. Um, so let me uh, give an example of another uh, topic here you could write on. And this is... Uh, uh, Number 12, should public schools, so again, should or should not, right? Yes or no. <clears throat> should public schools revise their history curriculum and their textbooks to include more thorough and accurate teaching of the causes and effects of slavery surrounding civil war? Well, I think we would all hopefully say yes, but uh, there are in fact people who would argue, no, they should not, right? Again, if you wanted to kind of wrap your head around, you know, Paragraph two, like, okay, why my, my opponents disagree? One of course is you can't make us as a state, you know, teach what California is teaching or, you know, some other state, Hawaii. Um, and of course they might have an ideological difference, meaning uh, they might view teaching of slavery as something that, well, 
you know, there are a lot of other things to teach or we'll teach it in a different way, but you can't mandate, you know, how it should be taught. Like you would think, you know, if you're going to teach algebra <laughs> that, you know, this abstract conceptualized math, that it should be taught exactly the same in all 50 states or around the globe, right? But when it comes to concepts and historical ideas and social issues, that's when it steps on a lot of people's toes, right? So inside of your Google Drive, there are some documents relating to this. One is this document here called Teaching Hard History about American Slavery. And uh, it was published by the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center is in uh, Atlanta. And for years now, decades, they have been advocating for uh, well, obviously, given their name for low income people, but often people of color, uh, you know, they, they do work on uh, tracking down white supremacists, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, like fascist uh, against uh, Black Lives Matter or against uh, Jewish people like they're anti-Semites or, or another kind of, uh, they even keep track of, for example, uh, extremists views like the Nation of Islam, which has a kind of militant uh, flavor to it. So here's a nice little quote from James Baldwin, the uh, African-American author uh, during the Harlem Renaissance and after. Uh, <clears throat> in this essay, Black English, this honest argument, he said, history is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. And it's just a nice reminder that um, we can never really escape our history. And those who turn a blind eye or try to revise history for their own agenda uh, usually doesn't work out well. But in this document, um, there's a lot of information you can use for this topic should you choose to write on it. And uh, it was kind of overseen by, uh, his name is uh, Pierre Hassan Kwame Jeffries. And he uh, graduated from Morehouse then went to get a PhD in American history in African American history. And he teaches at the Ohio State University. Um, so, in this, uh, there are points that they lay out that explains, for example, uh, that high school seniors struggle on even the most basic questions about American enslavement of African Americans. Now, let me go back to like why I'm showing you this. Um, if the super broad topic of essay number one is erasing racial injustice, then one of the possible uh, ways to erase injustice, right, is to teach history and social issues in a realistic and honest way. So if students here, high school seniors, ready to go into college, as it says here, only 8%, they, I think, uh, studied at least 15 or more states curriculums around the nation. And only 8% of high school seniors surveyed they can identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War. That's a pretty serious problem, right? So you have 92% of students like, oh, I'm not sure. I know it was a cause, but was it the central cause? Yes, it was. Um, or only two thirds don't know that it took a constitutional amendment to formally end slavery, all right? So all of these statistics are uh, provided in here that you can use again as sources, you know, uh, or this one is just rather telling. Teachers are serious about teaching slavery, but there's a lack of deep coverage of the subject in the classroom. Although teachers overwhelmingly over 90% claim they feel quote unquote comfortable Discussing slavery in their classrooms, their responses to open-ended questions reveal profound unease around the topic. To give you an example of that, <clears throat> there's a little table they have here later. 
a lot of uh, interesting images. Uh, we'll come back to this key concept list here in a moment. Where is that? Not that table. Um, so one where they surveyed uh, teachers. It's the next one, right? Here. So teacher comfort and support measures, right? So you could quote any of these statistics or paraphrase them. But of course, you would need to cite this document. And citing, of course, remember, is mentioning specifically in your sentence in their paragraph. Uh, documenting it is putting it fully described in alphabetical order on the works cited page. Um, but here's a good example going from, you know, to the question I strongly disagree or I strongly agree on the right hand side. So the textbooks I use do a good job of coverage or a good job of covering slavery. And only 8% say they strongly agree. And a pretty significant portion say they strongly disagree, right? So that's a real problem. And getting back to the question, you know, should high schools revise their history curriculum and their textbooks, then you could use that as like, well, yes, if, you know, teachers themselves are saying, you know, that they either strongly or do disagree that uh, textbooks are doing a poor job, then how about we revise the textbooks? How could that happen, right? Uh, or this next one, which is rather telling, slavery was a major cause of the Civil War. And of course, an overwhelming percentage says yes, right, because it was. But then notice that there are 16 and 2% disagree and strongly disagree respectively, or you know, 18%, almost 20%, almost a fifth of the teachers they surveyed said they disagree that slavery was the cause of the civil war, the, ma the major cause. Um, that is pretty problematic, which means you have history teachers in high school telling students that, well, yeah, it was a cause, but it wasn't the major cause, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty troubling. So <clears throat> going back to this key concept list up here earlier in red, um, right here. So <clears throat> they had a list of 10, 10 concepts here, okay? what they were looking at for these states in the curriculum, you know? And they wanted to know, okay, are these high schools teaching slavery in which a practice, or, or are they presenting it this way? Slavery, which is practiced by Europeans prior to the arrival in the Americas was important to all of the colonial powers and existed in European North America colonies, North American colonies. So is it being presented that way, that it was you know, important to colonial power and it already existed? If they're not, that's a problem. Or number two, slavery and the slave trade were central to the development and growth of the economy in British North America and later United States. Again, if they're not teaching that, that's a major problem. And so um, these are across the board, looking at curriculum, right? Slavery was an institution of power. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by uh, a real problem in our country, folks. Um, some of you, because clearly not all of you, are from the state of Louisiana. That is, you've grown up and or been educated in Louisiana. <clears throat> and you can see here, the you know, discussing some states individually, and here's Louisiana, okay? So the first mention of slavery is in the fifth grade, but look how it's explained <laughs> or mentioned. Uh, when students in the fifth grade are asked to explain, give examples of how Native Americans, Europeans, and free and enslaved 
Africans adapted to living conditions in New England colonies and middle colonies and Southern colonies. So rather than ask fifth graders who, you know, in this time and age of, you know, cell phones and the internet, uh, fifth graders are pretty savvy. Uh, they're not immune to being aware of, you know, you know, Black Lives Matter and other kinds of issues. But here they're being asked to not really address slavery as a horrific human rights issue, but like, well, how did they, how do they adapt in these colonies? <laughs> okay, um, in Louisiana. And then they end up by concluding the standards in general, the Louisiana standards in general, duck the question of whether slavery caused the Civil War. The seventh grade standards describe the election of Lincoln as one of the key events, ideas, and people that led to the Civil War, right? Because, <laughs> um, you know, it's the South, Louisiana. Overall, the Louisiana grade level expectations are shamefully vague when it comes to the history of American slavery, particularly for a state in which slavery was practiced until it was abolished by the 13th Amendment. And notice of all these key concepts, right, that they only, Louisiana only really does number one, that they miss entirely all of the other. So that's a real problem if we're allowing students in, for example, Louisiana to graduate and not know that slavery was the major cause or that slavery was an institution of power. It's not being taught like that. Well, surprise, surprise, why many students who graduate, especially students who are Caucasian or not people of color, um, they would have this kind of skewed, distorted view of what the South meant, right? Because you'll often hear people say, well, you know, don't get rid of that Confederate statue or monument because it represents you know, our, our heritage, right? Speaking of which, you could write on that issue right here, number 11, if you wanted to. Should statues, portraits, street names, and other reminders of the Confederacy be replaced and moved into museums or be eliminated altogether? Um, so, you know, that's something you could write on. But part of if you're going to write on this topic, right, then again, you would need to think in paragraph two of, well, who would, who would disagree with removing statues or Confederate memorabilia? Well, those who had this very skewed, distorted view of what the South was all about, right? And it, was, it wasn't about uh, slavery and, you know, it wasn't an institution of power and so on, uh, because it's not being taught that way for generations, you know? Um, yeah, so recently uh, there has been this issue called uh, CRT or critical race theory which um, is really a kind of uh, legalistic, uh, sociological slash legalistic uh, take on institutionalized racism. Um, and what, uh, what's her name here? Uh, Hannah Jones, who's in our uh, Google Drive, I uh, have a picture of her there. <clears throat> so here she is. Uh, she is uh, a very uh, well educated, intelligent, and kind of a tour de force when it comes to journalism and civil rights issues. As you can see here, uh, she was working for the New York Times Magazine. Uh, she's won you know, a number of awards. Uh, she received her uh, bachelor's in history and African-American studies from Notre Dame, studied at uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And so um, she, uh, you can find her uh, on Twitter, 
at in because her first name was Nicole in Hannah Jones. Um, <clears throat> she's riffing off of here of Ida Wells. Uh, Ida B. Wells, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ida B. Wells, who was the first African-American female journalist, right? Uh, investigative journalist. And so, uh, you know, Ida Bell Wells is her name here, but uh, Anna Nicole Jones is ripping off of that. Um, anyway, she, uh, Hannah Jones, uh, she like developed this curriculum that she wanted to institutionalize in schools called Operation 1619, right? Uh, and I think, or hope most of you know that, uh, or sorry, not Operation, but the 1916 project. Um, that 1619, of course, refers to uh, the very earliest date we can uh, go back and say that um, people from, you know, other countries, particularly Africa, were, uh, you know, enslaved and brought to the United States. So um, you can see here, right, uh, that for a few years now, since it's been brought up, it's caused, oh, you know, look, there she is, um, caused some real problems, right? Uh, education about slavery. Uh, but people don't want to incorporate it because they, <laughs> here, here's an argument. Um, well, I would hate for students in class to feel uncomfortable about uh, history, right? And they're, without mentioning names or, or demographics, they're roughly basically saying I wouldn't want Caucasian or people who aren't people of color to feel uncomfortable about learning uh, the true history, right? So uh, it's received a lot of um, both criticism and praise, this, this project, right? Um, and, you know, like here, this image that says, you know, it's a illustration of the landing of Africa's in Virginia in 1619, you know? Because again, we know this was uh, a real thing, but how many students learned that? You know, how many students in high school are taught that, you know, we can go back as far as 1619? That's well before, you know, 1776, the declaration, and certainly even way before the uh, Civil War. Um, so if you want to go check out the 1619 project and talk about how it should be used. Uh, I'm not a subscriber, so I can't apparently log in to the New York Times, but uh, here's a print edition. <clears throat> and you can read about it and use any of this information to, uh, you know, maybe quote or incorporate into your essay one, right? <clears throat> So uh, yeah, this is the New York Times Magazine print version. So uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think it would be a great, uh, there she is again, Nicole Hannah-Jones, um, a great service to our country if we taught things like this in, in this way. But uh, you know, you're up against a lot of people who um, are unwilling to you know, meet this kind of true history, so to speak, right? Um, so yes, Black Lives Matters protests and that kind of thing is needed and helpful, but we also kind of need to, in many ways, dig deeper. You know, if we really want to erase racism, let's let's uh, let's start from the beginning and teach kids. You know, in fifth grade or even earlier. You know, like okay, look, look at this. This is. Uh, an 1872 portrait, so 1872 after uh, you know the Civil War, of African Americans serving in Congress. Did you guys know that we actually had you know uh, senators and representatives in the United States Congress, the 
first and 42nd Congress. Well, hopefully many of you do, right? But how often is this kind of information being taught in schools, right? So yeah, there's, there's that kind of information you could certainly use and incorporate into your essay one, which again is due uh, Monday, February 21st. Okay, folks, I think that's about it for this essay one. I will uh, be posting this uh, soon, probably today. And uh, there's going to be another video lecture. One already exists as a link in module three here in Canvas uh, or on the homepage of uh, Canvas. The, uh, the essay, I'm assuming the video lecture on uh, how to avoid plagiarism, which is going to go in great detail about uh, what not to do so that, uh, you know, you don't receive an F zero on your paper. Um, all right, folks, uh, take care and stay warm and be well. Bye.